See this broken car? What if I told you it's now a 3D model? No fancy equipment, no complex software, just my phone and a free app. Whether you're scanning small objects or massive environments, this app is a game changer for 3D artists. And today's video is sponsored by Kiri Engine, the app that's making high quality 3D scanning accessible to everyone. In this video, I'll walk you through its completely free as well as the paid features and show you how you can use it to create impressive 3D models no matter the scale. It's no surprise that 3D scanning has become far more accessible compared to just a few years ago. I still remember when I first got into it, experimenting with an open source software called Meshroom. I learned the basics, found a cool looking rock and well, you know how it goes from there. In case you're new to all of this, the type of 3D scanning I'm talking about, often synonymous with 3D scanning itself because of its popularity, is photogrammetry. It's where a 3D model is generated by stitching together multiple overlapping images of an object taken from different angles. It's super cost effective, meaning you can grab your smartphone right now, take a bunch of photos of an object from every angle, and feed them into a software like Meshroom. The software will handle the rest. You can get as advanced as you like, but it does come with a steep learning curve if you're new. And here's the catch. It relies entirely on your local hardware, which can slow things down and make it less portable and efficient. And that's where Kiri Engine changes the game. With Kiri Engine, you can scan and manage all of your models directly from your smartphone, and all the heavy processing work is done on their servers. This makes it not only super portable, but also highly efficient, since you can upload multiple scans at once without stressing your device. And as we'll explore, the app brings a host of features that go beyond traditional photogrammetry, especially when you unlock the paid plan. The free plan is still incredible powerful with no restrictions on the photo scanning features and speaking of free you know what else is free that little like button right down there it won't cost you a thing but it'll make my day you can either start taking pictures right from the app which also provides a helpful tips menu for improving your scan quality it also allows for a manual mode too so if your native camera does not let you adjust the iso shutter speed and aperture manually it would be a good idea to take your photos directly in the app instead you can also switch to the video mode which takes a photo every one to five seconds depending on your settings the free version allows up to 100 photos and it even gives you a neat little progress bar to indicate whether you have taken enough images. Personally, I've found my average range to be around 45 to 80 images, with 60 to 70 images being the sweet spot for consistently good results. So if you're worried about the 100 photo limit, don't be because it's actually quite generous. The paid version though, increases this limit to 300 photos if you're really serious about it. Once you've captured your photos, you'll get a screen like this, prompting you to name your project, manage your images, and if you took them directly in the app, ensure that they're saved to your phone storage. Auto object masking is a great feature that cuts out the 3D object from the background, especially useful when you keep the camera stationary and rotate the object. With auto masking enabled, you can even flip the object midway through the scan to capture its underside, and the app's smart algorithm will handle the rest, giving you clean geometry with just the object and none of the background clutter. Here's where you can set the polygon count and texture resolution. Ultra and 8K are exciting recent additions available through the paid plan. There's also a new texture smoothing option designed to improve consistency where some areas of your photos might have come out blurry. It's worth testing this feature out first to see how it affects your results and if you're working with professional grade photos you might want to keep it turned off. Lastly, you can select the target file format and choose whether you'd like to allow Kiri to use your data to train their own AI or make the model public for others to view. Hit upload and once your images are in the cloud, your project gets queued for processing. This queuing can take a few minutes depending on the time of day, followed by an additional 15 to 30 minutes for the processing itself. Meanwhile, you're free to scan and upload more objects, and here's the best part. There is no limit to how many scans you can upload simultaneously, even on the free plan. You'll get a notification when the processing is finished, and from there, you can tap on your model to view it directly on your phone. At this point, you can crop the model, adjust the textures to your liking, and make any final tweaks. The app also allows you to export your model straight from your phone, and the export menu in the paid plan provides several parts powerful options. You can automatically generate a retopologized quad mesh, apply PBR textures, select your preferred format and resolution, and even generate a rig for your object if needed. Once you're happy with your settings, simply hit process and send, and within a few minutes, you'll receive a download link in your email. It's also worth mentioning that you can access all of your scans and even upload new ones directly from your PC using their web platform. The experience is practically identical to the app, so it really just comes down to your personal preference. In the beginning, I definitely overestimated estimated my experience with photo scanning. I thought, why not start with something small and intricate like this pine cone? So I set up this makeshift pro setup with diffuse lighting and a close-up camera, feeling pretty confident. And well, 
failed miserably. Not ready to give up, I tried hanging the pine cone from a thread and scanned it against different backgrounds, rotating it slowly along the string, thinking maybe this would work. Nope, failed miserably again. The problem wasn't the app, it was me. I was constantly confusing the algorithm or not feeding it enough data for it to properly process and give me a clean result. So here's what I realized. When it comes to 3D scanning, you've got two main options. Either revolve the camera around the object or keep the camera stationary and rotate the object. Now based on my trials, the stationary camera and turntable object approach gave me inconsistent results every time. On the other hand, when I revolve the camera around the object, like traditional photogrammetry, the results were much cleaner. My guess is that the algorithm is optimized for a moving camera so it expects the changing background as well as it helps calculate the overlaps and generate the points for the mesh more effectively. So if you're starting out, I'd recommend sticking with the method that revolves around the object. It will save you a lot of frustration. If you do want to go with the other method, make sure you turn on auto object masking while uploading. It is a required option to get anything usable in this case. With that lesson learned, I went ahead and did multiple scans of different objects. My biggest piece of advice, keep the object stationary and revolve around it. Start at either a high or low angle and work your way around the object in 3 or 4 layers, making sure it stays centered and fully visible in the shot. Here's what that looks like. If we're scanning this object, we start from the top, go around once, slowly lower the camera to be level with the object and then do another pass. Finally, we bring the camera even lower and go around once more for a complete scan. This ensures you've covered enough angles for a clean processing. Now that I've learned my lesson, I'll be sticking to scanning simple objects like rocks and statues. Psych! Let's go scan a car. Or not. Turns out the broken car from the intro got towed away and now we've got nothing cool to scan. But lucky for you, I did a test scan when I first scouted the place. Using the same techniques I just showed you, I managed to get this result. Now I couldn't scan the rear of the car because there wasn't enough clearance, but even with that limitation, this turned out to be a totally usable model. The only issue here is the texture, it has baked in lighting, and this can mess with your scene, but I found a workaround in Blender. So let's take a look. First, I cleaned up the surrounding geometry that wasn't needed. My plan was to place this car in a forest clearing surrounded by vegetation to show it had been abandoned for a while. And here's where I decided to turn the baked in lighting bug into a feature. I set up the scene to match the lighting baked into the textures. By creating an evening setting and positioning the sunlight to come from the right side, I made the lighting work in our favor. I also carefully placed the camera to hide any imperfections, like the hole on the top of the car where fewer points were generated. And to add to the story, I covered that hole with a mossy rock which I think enhances the overall scene. Now to fix this yellowish tint from the baked in sunlight on the texture, I used the mix color node set to divide. I plug the base color map into the first input and then use the yellowish color pick directly from the texture for the second input. I ran the base color through a color ramp node and used it as a factor for the mix color node so that the brighter, more highlighted areas are more affected. The divide node then removes the yellow tint by essentially subtracting it from the texture, giving me more control over the shading without the sunlight overpowering the colors. To add a bit more character to the car, I created a simple procedural moss setup in Blender. This helped make the car look more worn down and like it's been sitting in that clearing for ages. After setting that up, I just spent a few hours putting everything together and here's the final render. This should serve as a good example of how you can scan just about anything from your surroundings and even the result isn't exactly what you expected, you can still use it to tell beautiful stories. By the way, if you want access to the project files I'm using in this video, or you'd like to see more detailed breakdowns and exclusive content, be sure to check out my Patreon page. Now, while the free features of Kiri Engine are incredibly powerful, there are times when you'll run into objects that are much harder to scan, particularly featureless objects like smooth surfaces or transparent materials. And that's where the paid plan comes in, bringing in some seriously advanced tools like featureless object scanning and 3D Gaussian splatting or 3DGS for short. The thing with photogrammetry is that it works best with objects that have diffuse surfaces, Basically, objects that have a lot of unique static feature points for the algorithm to recognize and reconstruct. That's why it struggles with glossy, translucent, or textureless objects. The featureless object scanning feature in Kiri Engine gets around this limitation by using NERFs, Neural Radiance Fields technology. Essentially, NERFs use a neural network to figure out how light interacts with every point in a scene, learning how light bounces off objects and what color or brightness should be for each point. It creates an invisible cloud of data that describes how the object looks from every angle. Unlike traditional photogrammetry, NERFs don't directly produce geometry, so Kiri Engine uses smart algorithms to convert that volumetric data into a 3D model. This allows you to scan objects that would otherwise be impossible with regular photogrammetry. Another cutting-edge technique that makes scanning challenging 
challenging objects possible is called 3D Gaussian Splatting or 3DGS. 3D Gaussian Splats are essentially a way to represent a 3D object or scene using small, soft, blurry ovals called splats. Each splat has a position in 3D space along with its own color, size, and transparency. Together, these splats approximate the shape and appearance of the object. This is another form of volumetric representation, similar to nerves, but instead of light fields, we're using splats to describe the object. And here's where Kiri Engine really shines. There's a very cool beta feature that allows you to turn your 3D GS scans into usable 3D meshes. While uploading your 3D GS scan for processing, you can choose to check this option and convert the splats into a fully functional mesh. This feature is still in beta, but it's already incredibly promising for capturing objects that are otherwise tricky to scan. Now that we know our options, it's time to put them to the test. For this, I'm going to be using a very special coffee mug I got at the Blender conference back in 2022. It's the perfect test object. It's hollow, it's featureless inside and out, and it even has a recognizable logo and text, so we've got a bit of everything. First up, I did a photo scan with auto object masking turned on, and well, <laughs> it turned out like this. It's just a flat plane with some strange textures, no sign of the mug whatsoever. Hard pass. So I uploaded the same set of photos, but this time with auto object masking turned off. And here's what I got. Holes everywhere. Definitely unusable. Another pass. Now let's move on to the featureless scan mode. You can either take a video directly in the app or upload footage from your gallery. And if you use a dedicated camera or drone, you can upload from your PC as well. The method is the same. Make circular passes around the object, covering all angles. With the recent update, you can record up to 3 minutes, which is plenty of time for a few revolutions. The upload menu looks like this, pretty straightforward. So let's hit upload and get this processing. Now this method does take a bit longer to process than photogrammetry, but that's to be expected with the added complexity. While that's processing, we'll also record a video for the 3DGS feature. In the upload menu, there's a new checkbox for include mesh beta, and we're turning it on to see if it gives us a usable result, or maybe even something better than the other methods. The featureless scan turned out pretty clean overall, except for the insides of the mug. It seems that it approximated the mug as a solid object and then sealed off the top with some white projections. The overall shape is accurate, but the text came out a bit wobbly. Now for the 3D GS scan, which actually picked up a bit of everything from the environment around the mug. It's impressive considering those details were only visible in certain frames. The mug itself looks great from a distance, its shape is nearly perfect, and the text and logo are much clearer than the featureless scan. But just like before, it sealed off the top of the mug. If you zoom in, you can actually see some of the individual splats that make up this mug. It's a unique representation, but the overall result is solid. Now, the only way to find out if these scans are truly usable is to export them out of Kiri Engine and bring them into Blender. Let's see what we can work with. To work with the 3D Gaussian splat files, there's a free Blender add-on that makes importing and setting up PLY files a breeze. Here's how it works. Just click this button, locate your file, and import it. When it first shows up in the viewport, you'll see a hazy point cloud. If you zoom out, you can even see the boundaries of the model. In the rendered view, it looks like this, almost like cotton balls floating in space. Now if you turn off this checkbox here, it'll switch to the mesh version of the Gaussian splats, which is the more accurate representation. You can also adjust this slider to control the percentage of splats visible in the viewport, which helps optimize performance. If you set the slider to 1, you'll see all the available splats, and here's what that looks like in the render view. Apparently, the developers at Kiri Engine are working on their own open source add-on for importing 3DGS files into Blender, and it was brought to my notice at the last moment. And trust me, it looks so much better than the previous add-on. As far as I understand, it works by positioning each splat to align perfectly with the camera's perspective, giving it a much cleaner appearance. It's compatible with EV and offers a bunch of additional features like high quality splats rendering and the option to control whether the splats are affected by the lighting in your scene. To learn more about it, check out their press release and documentation. With that said, let's continue with the rest of the video. The converted mesh version of this is available as an OBJ file. As you can see, the mesh version looks pretty rough right now. It's important to remember that this feature is still in beta, so it's not perfect yet. But I do have high hopes for its usability as the technology develops. The cleanest result so far is definitely the featureless scan. With a bit of smoothing in Blender Sculpt mode, this scan could easily be used as a prop in a scene. And finally, the photogrammetry model. Well, that one's absolutely unfixable and unusable in this case. Now that we've looked at both texture-rich and textureless objects and the best methods to scan them, let's take things up a notch. What if the object is a combination of both? For example, this glass bowl filled with seashells and rocks. I decided to test this by using both photogrammetry and the featureless scan under the same lighting conditions. 
And here's what I found. Surprisingly, the photo scan turned out better in this case. There's just one small hole that's easily fixable. On the other hand, the featureless scan gave me multiple holes and less detail overall. So with objects like this that combine different textures and materials, it really seems to be a hit or miss. My advice? Try both techniques yourself, and with practice, you'll start to instinctively know which method will work best in different scenarios. Now I would show you the LiDAR scanning capabilities of this app if I had an iPhone, but there's no way I'm shelling out that kind of money for a phone that just seems to stay the same every year, so maybe next year, when the next iPhone is hopefully worth buying. As a final note, I want to highlight how impressive the 3D Gaussian splatting feature is. I used it to scan the broken car, and it preserves so many details thanks to its unique data representation. I I even managed to scan an entire section of a train using this method, and the level of detail is incredible. I hope the developers continue to refine this feature, especially the algorithms that convert splats into meshes, because it has tremendous potential for capturing complex objects. 3D Gaussian splatting may still be in beta, but my channel isn't. Hit that subscribe button to keep up with all of my latest videos, no beta testing required. To wrap things up, we've explored a ton of different scanning techniques, from traditional photogrammetry to advanced tools like nerve-based scans and 3D Gaussian splatting. We've seen how Curie Engine performs with everything from small textured objects to large featureless ones and even entire sections of a train with just using a smartphone. No matter what kind of 3D project you're working on, Curie Engine's features make high quality 3D scanning accessible for everyone, whether you're just starting out with free tools or diving into the advanced capabilities of the paid plan. I hope this video helped you see just how powerful your phone can be for scanning nearly anything around you. But if you're wondering what comes next in the world of 3D creation, don't miss this video where I explore the cutting edge tools driving generative AI and 3D modeling. It might just change how you think about the future of design.